Uh, awesome. Uh, that was, I mean, I feel like that introduction basically tells you everything about Dialyzer. We can go home now. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, but that, that does mostly cover uh, why I think Dialyzer is great. Um, so, hi, my name is Emma Cunningham. Um, I think the slides got sent out already, but if you didn't see that link before or if you need it again, um, you can follow this tiny CC link. Um, uh, I came up here from LA. Um, I've been a functional programming advocate and devotee since even before I wrote my first line of code. Uh, so before I became a software engineer, uh, I was a formal semanticist doing a lot of stuff with the, with the lambda calculus and category theory. And that's actually how I got into functional programming. Um, a friend of mine who was uh, working on programming language theory uh, was like, hey, you do a lot of lambda calculus stuff. Did you know that I do too? <laughs> um, so I learned Scheme and then Common Lisp and then I moved over into the ML languages. Um, and when I started actually uh, writing code and, and working as an engineer, um, I often was chastised when I first started working because at the time people were like, well, what are you going to build with your functional programming languages? Um, so I have to say that I'm quite thrilled to be alive in this moment of time where functional programming is finally becoming uh, something that people aren't really ridiculing like that outside of academia. Um, and people are starting to see the benefits of it um, and using it at scale um, in a lot of like different applications. Um, I currently work uh, as a senior software engineer at Second Spectrum. We're headquartered in Los Angeles. We also have an office in Shanghai and also one in Lausanne, Switzerland. Um, we are the official optical and tracking or optical tracking and analytics provider for the MBA. So what that means is we install cameras, uh, about six to ten high uh, def cameras in uh, all of the stadiums around the country where MBA games are played. Um, and from that video feed, our CV software is able to do basic object detection. So we know who's on the court, uh, where the ball is, stuff like that. From that object detection layer, we're able to uh, create an event semantics layer using machine learning. So we are able to detect to to say things like, um, what type of pick and roll was that? What very specific type of pick and roll was that? How many defenders um, and at what distance were uh, on the player taking the shot? And what might be the likelihood of that shot making it in? Um, the team that I work on um, is the sports performance and analytics team. So we uh, take that raw data um, that the ML and CV teams are creating and we build full stack data visualizations that surface that data in a way that can be meaningful for coaching staff, leagues, um, and also media broadcasters as well. Um, we've been using Elixir on uh, production projects for about the past year and a half now. And we have come to really love the language for lots of reasons. Um, the language features themselves, the ability to scale really nicely. Um, and today what I'll be talking about is one practice that we've added to our development process for Elixir that's made working in Elixir even more joyful and wonderful, and that's type checking. Um, so in this talk, a couple of things that we're going to hit on. So um, I am a huge theory nerd, so we're going to start at the point of theory. I think understanding some of the theory of where this stuff is coming from also um, one, it's really cool history, and two, uh, further legitimizes um, why types can be so powerful in our development practices. Then from the theory perspective, we'll look at how we can apply these concepts directly within our development processes, and then finally, hopefully, leave uh, feeling a little bit more free of stress because we've got a type checker that has our back. Um, but like I said, we're going to start with theory. Um, so in doing so, we're actually going to go to a moment in time just before type theory emerged. Um, and at that time, a certain branch of mathematics had become very interested in what it means to mean something. Um, and the reason why people were interested in this question is because they had started to wonder, what good is it to say that 2 plus 2 equals 4 if we can't formalize what 2 means, um, and if we don't know exactly how to say what plus means, and really tricky, what does equality mean? What does that symbol mean? What, what implications does that have for what we're trying to say about really basic mathematical expressions? So from here, this is what gives rise to the birth of formal semantics um, and mathematical logic. And this leads to George Cantor in the 1870s coming up with naive set theory, which um, he formalized using natural language, but created a way for people to start talking about things like, what does it mean for something to be something, to be included in a set? Um, from there, in 1879, Gottlob Frege formalized these notions into a specific language, a formal language that constructed the logic for set theory. Um, and he does this in a work called the Begriffsschrift. 
Um, this is pretty cool uh, because now mathematicians have a language, a formal language that they can use to talk about mathematical proofs, um, what equality might mean, and things like that. Um, there's just one little problem, um, and that is discovered by Bertrand Russell in 1901, where as he's looking through Cantor's proofs for set theory, he discovers this like weird paradox that emerges. Um, he writes in 1902 to Frege, just as Frege is about to publish the Grundgesetze der Arithmetik, the Foundations of Arithmetic, um, and he asks, um, is, is there no reason why in naive set theory um, that you couldn't define a set S such that it contains all the sets that do not contain themselves? Um, and that alone might not seem so damning, right? Um, but if you can do such a thing, then you can also ask the question, does S contain itself? Um, a more colloquial formulation of this paradox um, is also known as the barber's paradox. And so it's the question, or it's the formulation of, uh, let's say there's a barber who shaves all the people who do not shave themselves, then who shaves the barber? Um, you, you can see how that, that sort of and, uh, leaves you in sort of this like endless uh, loop of like, well, he shaves himself, but he doesn't, but he does, but he doesn't. Um, there are a couple of ways to avoid this paradox. So one way to do that is to just alter uh, the rules of Cantor's naive set theory itself. Um, and that's what Ernst Zermelo does with uh, the Zermelo axiomatic set theory. Um, and he proposes an axiom of extensionality that's just a rule that says we can't do this. Um, yeah. um, Bertrand Russell, on the other hand, um, for the most, uh, he didn't discover the, he, he wasn't looking for a flaw to take it down. He was just genuinely curious. Um, and so what his solution consists of is um, not changing any part of Cantor's naive set theory, but amending the logical language that Frege had formulated so that there's an additional piece of apparatus that assigns a type to every term within the language and then restricts operations or predicates in a way that they're only limited to a certain kind of type. And this is what ends up getting us out of this bind with respect to these types of paradoxes. So, uh, you could say, types were created, the, the sort of historical origin for, of types was to avoid paradoxes, which is so cool, really great, but um, none of us, I'm guessing, are being paid to squash paradoxes in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, so how does this relate to what we actually do? Um, so we need one more piece of theory to get us there. Um, and that's the Curry-Howard isomorphism. So, I have to because I work at a sports tech company, sorry. <laughs> um, the curry Howard isomorphism is not uh, postulating some kind of relationship between Stephen Curry and Dwight Howard, but rather the Curry and Howard, um, in this case, refer to the mathematician Haskell Curry, who to a lot of us this name is pretty familiar, right? Um, and logician William Howard. And this work started in 1934 and lasts several decades into the 70s. Um, and what what Curry and Howard were working on was demonstrating that um, these two seemingly different fields um, actually have a lot to say about each other. So another way to think about this is that the Curry-Howard isomorphism demonstrates that what we use as formal notation for syntactic validity, uh, let's say com combinatory logic, has a direct relationship to the formal notation for computing semantic meaning, the lambda calculus, for example. Um, this is extended to include category theory by Joaquin Lambic, um, closer to the 70s. Um, and all of these generalizations basically allow us to start seeing connections between to, between the work being done in both logic and computation. So this is how we get from paradoxes uh, to software. So um, a few of the ways that we can go from between logic and computation or computer science, um, I think one that you'll see if you uh, have worked with any of like the ML languages, Haskell in particular, is this co concept of proofs as programs. Um, and then a whole bunch of other really cool things that we don't have time to dive into too deeply, but um, if you get anything from this talk, it's learn more about the Curry-Howard isomorphism if you haven't done so already. Um, but anyways, all of this is to say that um, if, there's this, if we can draw these kinds of connections, then um, maybe we can think about paradoxes and logical theory as if uh, as sort of similar to bugs in software. And if that's the case, then if types can save us from paradoxes, they can probably also save us from, from bugs of a certain kind. 
Um, so the rest of this talk is going to ground us, ground the theoretical stuff in more practical real world stuff. Um, but I did want to take a moment for us to appreciate this, this like thing together. Um, I started learning about the curry howard isomorphism when I was working as a formal semanticist. Um, and then it just continues to amaze me how that relates to areas even outside of linguistics where I first learned about these things um, and into software engineering as well. Um, OK, so back to the real world. So type systems. Um, we talked about theory. Now let's look at um, how it applies directly to the kinds of type systems that we might see in different programming languages. Um, so this, again, I think a lot of this stuff, I think, um, for people who have been working as engineers for a while, uh, is pretty familiar to you. So a type system is just a set of rules that assigns types to unions, units of meaning, um, variables, functions, stuff that you would find within a language, and also dictates what constitutes a type error. Um, type systems can vary. They can be statically typed, where type values are known at compile time, um, or they can be dynamically typed, where they're associated with runtime values, and you don't need to specify anything up front. Um, types can also, type systems can also be strongly typed or weakly typed. Uh, strongly typed systems are ones where uh, the system errors when there are type conflicts versus weakly typed systems where um, perhaps there's some implicit type conversion or other fun, unpredictable stuff that happens when there's a type conflict. Um, and then a type safe language is just one that doesn't allow violations of the language's type system. And type checking is the process of both verifying and enforcing the constraints of types. And this can happen again at either compile time or at runtime. Um, and now uh, let's talk about sort of what kind of type system Elixir has and sort of what the consequences of that are. Um, so the good news is that you, if you've written any Elixir, already know about types in Elixir because you've worked with them, right? Um, we've got all kinds of stuff that you've worked with before. Um, and in addition to that, you may also already be leveraging some of the power of types in Elixir through, say, guard clauses, um, doing some kind of pattern matching, things like that. Um, out of the box, um, Elixir is strongly and dynamically typed, so nothing's going to catch uh, these kinds of type errors in the development process. So in this example, we have a function of foo that takes some n, and then it returns n times 2. Um, and let's say we have another function bar that calls foo, but with a string this time. Um, this is only going to error at runtime. The, pilot, the compiler will not catch this, unfortunately. Um, and so this, this, has, this can have dire consequences, right? So. <clears throat> So I went through ahead of time and converted all of my like screenshots to uh, dark text on light text. And then this one, I was like, no, it doesn't matter if you can read this or not. This is a wall of errors, and it doesn't matter because we never want to see this. Um, this is a runtime error. Um, and this is the code that produced it. Um, so we have our foo function again. And now let's say we have some function uh, called index that, get call, that uh, is called as a result of a get request. Um, now, within the index function, we're calling foo once again with an uh, invalidly typed argument, a, the string to, not to the actual integer. Um, so when this happens, this is going to uh, result in an error. But again, this isn't going to be caught at runtime. You won't see those errors until runtime. And actually, maybe you won't see those errors, but your user sees these errors at runtime. Um, now, some of you might be saying to yourself, well, we would never. We, this wouldn't happen because we've got like great test coverage. Um, and that's a fair point. I will come back to talking about tes tests a little bit later. Um, but Regardless, like this is this is still like a little unfortunate at the very least, right? Um, it can range from unfortunate to horrible to just downright frustrating and rage-inducing, um, <laughs> and such is our lot in life with the current types with the type system that Elixir inherits from Erlang. Um, so what can we do about it? Well, one, we might just like completely go back through and like alter the semantics of the language so that um, we have a different type system. Or we can do what the creators of Dialyzer did in 2006. Um, so uh, Dialyzer introduces this new notion of success typing. And what success typing does is it allows us to preserve the semantics of the language, um, but it gives us a tool to still be able to catch these errors before runtime. Um, and the authors of Dialyzer in their paper about success typing um, postulated that such a type checker that does not require altering the language itself, that 
uh, adapts to the language, um, should be simple and readable, uh, should work without type declarations being there, um, and can be able to infer some of that type information. It can also accept hints when you want to give it hints, but you shouldn't have to. Um, and it should only complain on type errors that would guarantee a crash. Um, so, with such a tool like that, now all of a sudden if we had a function calling foo with a string, um, We'll get, we'll get this uh, when we run dialyzer. It'll just tell us before, well, hopefully before we deploy this. <laughs> um, so, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so dialyzer is a portmanteau for discrepancy analyzer, um, and it was written for Erlang. Um, Dialixer allows you to use dialyzer uh, with a mixed task for your Elixir projects. And what happens when you run dialyzer is that it generates a persistent lookup table, a PLT, um, based on the code that you've written um, and is able to make some of these type validations. So now type, type errors can be detected when you call a function with an argument whose type doesn't match the inferred or specified type signature. Hooray. Um, so how to get started, so it's also devilishly simple. Um, so, add a, so the first thing you want to do is you want to add it to your project. And then from there, uh, you could get and compile the dependency, then you generate the PLT. Um, one note is that this can take a very, very, very long time, and that's because Dialyzer is running through your entire code base, right? In order to be able to do these kinds of type validations, it has to know everything about your code base. So um, especially the first time you run it, it can take a while. Um, so make yourself a cup of coffee, go read some of the Curry Howard isomorphism correspondence papers. Um, but once you've generated the PLT, now what you can do is you can run mixed dialyzer um, and it will spit out error messaging that tells you um, when there's been a type violation that will result in a crash and also give you some hints on like where to go to correct that. Um, so given the example that we were working with, dialyzer has detected a type error at the function foo. Um, Oop, excuse me. Um, and now we can go back through, we can catch where that's uh, being called with an improperly typed argument and, and correct it. Hooray. Um, one thing to note is that using dialyzer in this way um, requires you to run the mixed task. And maybe you have some way to like run it every time you save, something like that. Um, but it also might be nice to get some of this information on the fly if you happen to be one of those kinds of uh, developers that likes that information safe in your IDE. Um, so great news, you can do that too. Um, so last fall, Jake Becker, um, with his Elixir LS language server uh, tool, um, incorporated support for Dialyzer. Um, there are also IDE plugins for both Atom and VS Code. Um, and what that support entails was an incremental Dialyzer server that runs uh, after each successful build, so you get this information directly in your IDE. So the nice thing is that you don't have to remember to run Dialyzer, and you also get uh, inline feedback about your type errors in your editor directly. Um, he does note uh, that this is experimental. Um, it also requires Erlang OTP20. Um, but the other nice thing about um, Elixir LS is that it also provides support for the new formatter in 1.6, so it's just a cool tool to have in your, in your um, arsenal. Um, I mentioned that most of the time, Dialyzer will be able to infer types for you, and you do not need to explicitly spell them out. Um, but there are some cases where, you, where it may not be able to, and you may want to be more explicit about your function's type annotation. Um, so Elixir already has support for that um, with the at spec attribute. Um, and so in this particular case, we've uh, added a um, <clears throat> excuse me, we added a type annotation that basically says, this is our function foo, it takes something of type integer, it returns something of type integer. Um, this is useful also if you wanna do some more complex type stuff, if your functions are dealing with like um, types that you're defining yourself, things like that. Um, and I actually, this is for a different talk, but um, I actually think thinking more deeply about types this way can also help you think about the programs that you're writing and um, kind of drive development in a certain way as well. Um, so these aren't necessary, but they can be useful. Um, and on my team at Second Spectrum, we found it useful to, an to add these type annotations as a default practice. Um, and now let's come back to that what about testing question. Um, so um, a lot of people, when I like tell them that I like love type safety, are like, but we can cover that in our tests already. And that's true. Um, 
But basically, adding type, uh, adding type checking to your development process means that you don't need to have your chest cover this, right? Um, adding type checking to your development process frees your chest from having to worry about these low-level things um, and lets you have your chest focus on um, core business logic concerns and be really specific to those needs and not have to worry about things that your type checker will just be able to catch for you. Um, some of the benefits that we have found on my team um, in incorporating this is one, um, like I showed you, uh, being able to catch these before runtime is great, so this uh, can lead to a reduction in runtime errors. Um, adding type annotations also can help with documentation and overall project maintainability. Um, and also, sleep, oh, sorry, also sleeping a little bit more easily at night. Um, I don't worry about being woken up in the middle of the night by Ops Genie Alerts quite as much anymore. Um, so, yeah, in general, this has sort of like helped us with uh, building like larger code bases that also um, multiple people can jump in and out of, understand what's going on, and also um, ensure that they're, like people aren't unintentionally uh, introducing er like these like really simple type errors to the code base. Um, that's it. Um, so I leave you with this image of Haskell Curry. Um, <clears throat> So one of the things that um, I kind of love about um, thinking about type theory in this way, and also like going all the way back to the historical perspective, um, again, is that these ideas came from outside of computer science before computing was even something that the people working on these things could even think about before computers were a thing that people were thinking about. Um, and so I always, I think this is kind of why I come back to the theory part, because I think it also highlights sort of the importance of one, uh, being open to ideas even outside of the field of our like immediate vision, um, and then also being able to draw that into like different things that we're doing. So uh, with that, I leave you with this image of Haskell Curry. Um, and I hope you can go forth and prove the validity of your programs using type checking. That's it. <laughs> All right, any questions? Um, more, more like a, a couple of comments. Yeah. From, from somebody who is a, a fan of Dionyzer and tests, but come from the Yaman world. Yeah. So a couple of things. The first one is that a while back, at, at least in the company I work for, we learned to do meta testing. That's a cool term we coined, but it is basically running the analyzer as part of your test suite. Oh, okay, yeah. So the errors are, are there, and they are on your test suite, so right. you don't pass con continuous integrated <coughs> and this is checked. Right. And if you do it from day zero, the PLT is small enough that it's not so time consuming. Right, right, right. Uh, and the other one, in the same vein, is that if you're running Dialyzer on your code, it's much more convenient to run it with the test code as well. Mm. Because on the test, you use the functions, and so Dialyzer is much, uh, has a much uh, easier way of finding errors because uh, it relates the ways where you're using the function with the definition of the function and your spec and everything. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great comment that also that also highlights again how um, type checking is not at odds with testing, but really yeah. can be something that you incorporate with great test coverage and and great test testing practices. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, what kinds of warnings? Are you thinking about things like, say, like large ABC size or something like that, or yeah, like that kind of stuff? So we've really, really been using Dialyzer for the type checking functionality. Um, not sure to what ex like to what extent, what kinds of other warnings that it might be able to capture like that. Something you yeah. need to fix. 
Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so making it run faster. So I think the suggestion of running it with your test suite, or at least just like running it incrementally as much as you can, because the, the smaller like the amount of change that you're introducing, the faster it'll be able to run. So it builds upon like the previous lookup table that it built. So if you just are running it often, then yeah. Um, and then I'll also say that, um, so the Elixir LS support also helps with that because, uh, again, like that's incrementally building upon every successful build, so yeah. Um, so do you have to, after you run the first time with that uh, PLT option, do you ever have to run that again or does it kind of regenerate automatically? Right, yeah, you don't have to run it with the PLT flag, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and adding them, is there any like tips to make it a little bit more digestible? The process of just like, like adding all. Um, oh, I see. So is there a way to sort of like use the tool to be able to tell you where you need to be at adding your type annotations and things like that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Like if you have a library that 90% of your code relies on, start just testing that one, and then slowly work up the layers. Yeah, all the refactoring. Yeah, I haven't had to do that with an Elixir project because we started using Dialyzer basically as soon as we uh, started using Elixir on my team. But we have had to do it with JavaScript where we've added, like, where we've moved to using TypeScript in our projects. And yeah, I think, like, regardless of what you're using, like, starting small and, like, going with, like, what's the, you know, what's getting, what's, what can you get the most bang for your buck from is a good way to start. Uh, yeah. Comment related to that is that Erlang, there's Typer, which will go through code oh, and right. spit out a list of specs, which is extremely helpful, especially if you have code that has nothing at all. But is that, can that be used in the Elixir environment? I, have I think you can run it yeah. on the code, but it might not. No, but I don't think there is a translation uh, from dash type, blah, 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 to add type, I know they are. Oh, right. Are right, you, you still need to translate from the Yeah, yeah, I don't think anybody implemented yeah. the translation of typer yet. Yeah. Or could you at least run it and look at the output? Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, oh, okay, on the beam. All right, got it, thank you. Okay, saw another hand over again. Yeah. Um, It will do that. So that's also is what makes it like the first time you do it like really long because yeah, it's 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 generating that for your entire code base. Oh right. That's how we've approached it, is just sort of relying on those wrapper functions. But yeah, I don't know if other people have done it in different ways. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you pattern map on the types of messages you expect to receive in each function. So in your handle call or handle chat, you can basically just get them more specific to the types of messages you expect. But I think it, it's up to something, because uh, the analyzer doesn't analyze the receive Right. That's just a compile time. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So 
So, so you have to use a rubber to make it cheaper. Yeah. But then you can use things like proper, like uh, Fred has talked about, where you can use state checking. So you would mock, you would essentially create a, a model of your process that's receiving messages and then send a message to the printer if it does crash or fix the state of the page or something like that. So that's what Thank you, everyone.